This is the DallasCowboys.com Draft Show. Your war room for insider news and draft analysis from deep within the confines of Cowboys headquarters at the Star in Frisco. The Dallas Cowboys select T.D. Lamb. Oh, he took it. And now, your hosts, Dane Brugler, Jeff Cavanaugh, Kevin Turner, and Kyle Yeomans. We are rolling along here on the DallasCowboys.com draft show just 42 days away. A Barry Church number away from the Dallas Cowboys and the 2021 NFL draft. We've got plenty to break down as we've got potential scenarios. First, second, third round. We've got plenty of prospects that we're going to get to and then also some pro days that we're going to hit in this episode of the Draft Show. Glad you're with us on DallasCowboys.com and the various streaming platforms. Jeff Cavanaugh, Kevin K.T. Turner rocking the mean green this afternoon or I guess this morning rather as North Texas of course playing in March Madness starting tomorrow against Purdue and then Dane Brugler who's a lot closer to March Madness than we are up in Ohio. He's a little bit closer to the Indiana madness. But, gentlemen, it's been a crazy week already with free agency. Some new players coming in for the Cowboys. A little bit of depth added. And then, of course, some starters that have thus walked on and, and gone elsewhere. But, KT, I know you're very adamant on Twitter that this is not the free agency show. This is the draft show. You've, I've seen that reply a couple times for you over the last 24 hours or so. But, doesn't free agency directly correlate with the draft? No, no, it totally does. I just like to, when I put out the tweet for everyone to ask their questions to you for Twitter on the 20s so I don't have to look <laughs> at it, and you can handle and filter the questions. Uh, when people start asking questions about free agency, I'm like, hey, ask questions about the draft. The free agency questions you can do, you know, we'll do that on Talking Cowboys or something. But yeah. it does correlate. Like, for instance... Uh, with the Cowboys picking at 10, I found it to be quite interesting that uh, the Broncos signed Ronald Darby, a cornerback. Does that mean that the Broncos would not take a cornerback at 9? Absolutely not, but it might mean they don't feel that urgency to take a cornerback at 9. I thought the Panthers getting Hassan Reddick um, was very interesting because uh, maybe they're toying around with the notion of maybe we trade pick 8 and maybe we could throw Brian Burns into it for maybe a Deshaun Watson package. You know, just little things like that is what uh, what I was kind of thinking of. In terms of what the Cowboys have done, we know with Cheeto gone, Jordan Lewis stays, you still have Anthony Brown. You might, you might say cornerback is not as urgent as maybe it was if you had lost Jordan Lewis too. Ooh. But you still got to upgrade at that position. So um, I don't think it changes it. I don't think it changes much of anything, to be honest. Jeff, do you think it changes anything from a Cowboys standpoint, the the fact of the players that have gone and then those that have stayed? Uh, I don't think it changes much, only because I think cornerback is still a really big position of need. Uh, I think it was, this is something that you should have known was going to happen as a Cowboy fan. Whether it was going to be Jordan Lewis or whether it was going to be somebody else in free agency, they weren't going to go into an NFL draft butt naked. They weren't sure. going to go in there with two with two NFL starting caliber-ish corners on the entire roster. Um, so, you know, Jordan Lewis is probably a slot guy. I wonder if they'll look at him at safety. Probably not, but let me just throw it out just in case. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, you weren't going to go into a draft with that big of a blinking light of need at a position. They were going to sign somebody, and they did. So now you, in theory, could go play on Sunday because you would have Jordan Lewis in the slot, Anthony Brown out wide, Trevon Diggs out wide, and you could play. And that's the goal, to get ready for the draft, is to sign the free agents that make it so that if you had to, you could go play. So now I can be closer to best player available and get the best value possible in the draft. Free agency is about need. The draft is about value. Let's go find the value. Dane, have there been any other moves around the NFL that could potentially shake, kind of like what KT was talking about, what the Cowboys are going to do in the draft, whether it's because they acquired a certain player or they did something specific in free agency? No, I don't think so. I mean, I do appreciate KT's uh, imagination with each one of these deals because, you know, <laughs> obviously it's, it's, you know, there's this ripple effect. Whatever 
when one thing happens, it affects other moves uh, and potentially on draft day. So, uh, you know, it, it is interesting to go down that, that rabbit hole. But I, I do agree with Jeff that, you know, this is the free agency is about filling needs so you can go out and play tomorrow. And it, it's more about rounding out your roster so on draft day, you know, you can take the best players, you can stick to your board, and you're not reaching for need and targeting a specific position and, and forcing things. Um, and, and so, you know, when just looking at, you know, we still have a lot, lot to happen in free agency. You know, we, we saw that first wave, and then there's a little bit of a lull, and then I think there's going to be, you know, slowly but surely pick back up a little bit, especially with some of these markets like the receiver market, the tackle market. Um, but, you know, for the most part, I, I, I don't think anything happened in free agency thus far that, that'll necessarily alter what we thought about how the Cowboys are going to attack the draft uh, here in a month and a half. Well, good. So we don't necessarily have to pivot on a whole lot. We can just kind of continue on with what we were talking about prior to this week, which is something that I know some people were worried about but I think it's exactly what we expected overall like Jeff said if you're a Cowboys fan you knew you're probably going to lose a corner keep a corner depending on which one it was and Cheeto signed with the Cincinnati Bengals within about five hours of the opening of free agency so of course it was then Jordan Lewis was the the next man up it seemed like from the corner position and really in my mind I think it was probably the better corner to keep because of the money Uh, but it was something that the Cowboys needed to get done now There have been a lot of pro days that have been going on over the last couple of weeks simultaneous with the free agency market and with kind of the the roster acquisitions. There's the continuation of this draft process. No NFL Combine this year. That's been uh, duly noted over the last couple of draft shows as well. But these, these pro days are actually happening and there's things that are official and unofficial and of course you got to take everything with a grain of salt Dane but before we go into the specific pro days what has been your overall thought of the pro day only process that we've really seen for the first time here in 2021 well obviously it's not ideal uh not having the combine but you know I'm, I'm glad we have something and you know the pro day circuit is interesting because obviously we're dealing with on-campus workouts so we're talking about different venues different tracks um you know some of these are inside some of them are outside uh and you know so just totally different environments and you know they structured it so they made it as easy as possible for uh you know scouts to hop from pro day to pro day uh hitting multiple pro days in one day uh, you know, yesterday, Illinois had their pro day in the morning. They scheduled Illinois State uh, pro day for the afternoon. So those guys can just zip over and, you know, they, they tried to make it as uh, scout friendly as possible. Um, and, you know, as we get these results coming in, some of them are, uh, you know, surprising. Um, some of them are more expected. But, you know, as always, it's just it's good to have the data because we're missing that from the combine. And so I'm just, you know, even if the pro day data isn't, you know, all it's not perfect in terms of how it's gathered, and you know, the is there a degree of you know, could, could a, a, an error oh, here or there Dane, could be off? Dane's calling hogwash on the pro day, <laughs> no, I mean, it, calling hogwash. He's doing I mean, it. It, it, like I said before, we're talking about fast tracks, slow tracks, inside, outside, you know, like it's it's tough, um, you know, it's some of these guys are running in, in tougher uh situations, so. You know, and as scouts, uh, you know, you're you're taught to maybe add a tenth of a second here or there, mm. depending on the track. And so there's a lot. It's a it's a more of a, a formula uh, when you're trying to boil down these these times and the data. But nonetheless, it, it's better than not having any data at all. So we're gonna take a we're gonna take Creed Humphrey's four four six that he ran on the twenty yard shuttle, and we're gonna we're gonna add a tenth of a second there. Is that what you're saying there, Dane? If it's a little too fast, because that would have tied. Uh, Ezra Cleveland for the fastest of last year's combine. So, I mean, there's been numbers that have still stuck out, but you're saying that it, it once again, you got to take it with a grain of salt. And I didn't really realize this until you said it a moment ago, but there's a system to it. Oh, yeah, definitely. And I mean, I, I wouldn't say you take, take with a grain of salt what's reported out there as the drills are happening. Because mm. people are doing it with their phones, they're, you know, like it's just. Wait for, you know, later on that day when the quote-unquote official times. Because, honestly, the uh, official times is whatever the NFL teams are using. Yeah. Okay? So, even if it's 
off by a little bit, it doesn't matter because if that's what NFL teams are going by, that's good enough for me to call it official. So Creed Humphrey, for example, the official uh, short shuttle for him, this is what NFL teams have, is 449. So ah. not far off, you know, pretty close to, to what he ran. So, um, but hey, that's another reason to get the beast because all the official <laughs> times uh, that NFL teams will be using will be in there for every single player. Looky and there. Also, if you don't if you don't get the beast, just watch me on YouTube and I do it in my head. I watched Eric Stokes <laughs> run his forty and I got I got three seven I got three seven eight. Wow, that's so a I just fast one 40. Is that a record? Two, that's 1, really 000. fast. Three one thousand. Well no, because I watched uh, Henry Ruggs and Jalen Waddle race on the internet. And I got that at 3.2. So that's the record. They both uh, ran a 3.2. Just one 1,000. That's fair. Two 1,000. And as, and as long as I count at the same There's speed a- every time, I think I'm in good shape. <laughs> it's the Kavanaugh like, uh, clock. For, for instance, when it goes to... Uh, but yeah, like I remember uh, Broadus though, like talking about how some, some fields are like uphill and downhill. Like uh, he's like, yeah, there's little, little pieces of floor, like where it's not flat land. But like Dane makes a good point. Like... It doesn't hurt to, like, wait a couple hours. Mm -hmm. Like, for instance, I will – and this is just me. This is no offense to anyone who's out there covering this stuff. But, like, I'll trust uh, Senior Bowl director Jim Nagy's time with a stopwatch over, you know, a guy named Steve on Twitter who just put something out. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Steve is a good dude. (laughs) Well, Steve just puts it out there real quick, and you're like, okay. Well, let's get the let's get. I'll, I'll trust the guy who you know runs the Senior Bowl, like, and he's got time. Like for instance, he had the times for Eric Stokes. But this is what's kind of like. And then also, we like overrate all these times sometimes too. We know Eric Stokes is fast. If Eric Stokes runs a four two five versus a four three two, what does it matter to me? Don't it count doesn't. it twice. Don't count it twice. Mm. So yeah. this goes back to a joke I've issued on this show before. But there's a reason Jeff and Dane titled their old podcast "Trust the Tape." That's that. They didn't you name don't it know "Trust the Pro did. Day." Trust you the don't Pro know why Day. We did that? Why well, don't? But trust the Pro Day. You can admit would have gotten terrible ratings. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. Hard to say, really. Hard to say. Oh, Man, that's a good one. Great. Well, hey, uh, Georgia. And- at Georgia, it's weird because did Georgia have half their guys run downhill and half of them run uphill? Because safety Richard LeCount running a four eight is probably not good. Yeah, that was real bad. Yeah, it, 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 the official was a little bit better than that, but yeah, I, it, he did not have uh, the best workout. Um, but I'll tell you who did, who had a pretty good workout? Uh, several players at the Texas Pro Day. Uh, Sam Cosme, just ridiculous, came in at six six three fifteen. 33-inch arm, so just good enough in terms of the arm length. But he ran a 4.85 with a 1.68 10-yard split, which is just unbelievable for that uh, for that size. So he was moving. He helped himself. Um, uh, Joseph Osai, I thought, ran well uh, at 256 pounds. He ran a 4.62. Uh, but one thing with Osai is it, it's you always take notice when a guy elects not to run – or to perform a certain drill. And Joseph Osai, who's not the most bendy guy, chose not to run the three cone or the shuttles. Mm-hmm. And that's, if, you know, if you're an evaluator, that's a red flag. You know, that, that be- sticks out like a sore better? thumb. Isn't that what? better? Because, like, when I, when I saw the Richard LeCount 40 time, yeah. like, if I'm his agent, I'm telling him, hey, we're just going to let people assume you run a 4.65. Like, we're not running. If I know I'm going to run a 4.8, if I know I'm going to put up a bad three-cone time, I'm going to have a meeting with my agent and be like, hey, what are NFL teams going to assume I would run if I don't do this? And am I actually going to run worse than that? We ain't running. Like, but some if you of these choose, guys need to not work out. If you, uh, And I, I get that. But if you choose not to run, then all of a sudden, you know, okay, we thought Joseph Osai was going to run a 7-2 three-cone. Uh, but then he chose not to run. It's like, oh, well, maybe it was even worse than that. Maybe it was 7-3. Maybe, you know, like your mind as an evaluator starts to really think, okay, well, maybe maybe it was so bad during testing. Because obviously, they, you know, he got three-cone time during uh, his training. Maybe it was just that. It wasn't even average. It was well below average. And so it, it, it's something that definitely stands out. And it instead of putting a number to it, it's going to leave evaluators to the – you know their imagination to come up with a number. So just it's 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 something worth noting and paying attention to. 
For sure. I just think, like, if Orlando Brown didn't work out at the Combine and didn't run, I think he would have made millions more dollars. Uh, like, his his workout was so bad that I was like, man, just let teams' imagination be yeah. as bad as they want because it wouldn't be that bad. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, and he's he's the extreme case because his, right. his numbers were historically bad. So, yeah, he, he's definitely an extreme case. But that and that's why with the like an Osai, it, because he didn't do the three cone, does that tell me that his three cone times during training weren't even average? You know, were they well below average? And so, but it, it you know, evaluators going to kept be kept guessing. Now, is that going to push him down draft boards? No, I, mean, I, I highly doubt it. Teams already knew he was a, a little stiff through the hips. Um, but it's just it's one of those things that it's it's part of it becomes part of his evaluation. Well, can, can I throw in one more thing, too? And I know we we're like, just bouncing the Texas, but I want to go back to Georgia real quick with Richard LeCount, whose numbers were not great. Um, and But, you know, he's got questions, too, because he had the motorbike accident, yeah. you know, in his senior year. But he's got, you know, a career uh, of some interceptions, you know, uh, ball skills, things like that. But I had written down in my notes, kind of slow and a little undersized. So, like, I saw his numbers, and I know the official numbers come out later, and I was like, I'm really not surprised – but is there pressure to run when Tyson Campbell's running or Eric Stokes is running or Monty Rice is running? Like, hey, all these guys are running. I'm going to get measured anyway. They're, they're going to know how – they're going to know I'm a, I'm a little short, even though he's got decent length with his long arms. I was kind of like, hey, that's kind of what I think Richard LeCount is. I kind of had got a little confirmed of what I thought about LeCount, at least after seeing his time yesterday. Well, and then on the flip side with a guy like LeCount, there are going to be some teams that look at that and say, oh, a 4 8, all right. Now, maybe we might be able to get him in the sixth round now. Wow. You know, like they're, they're doing a little fist pump when they see that number because instead of being a fourth or fifth rounder, which, you know, I think that's what most teams thought he would be, you know, mid season before that injury, um, you know, now maybe he could be in the later rounds. Obviously, the medicals would be a big part of that. Dane, what do you what did you think about him previous to the injury? Because I know you've kept up with him pretty much the last couple of years, but previous to the injury, was he a different player than he was after that motorcycle accident? Well, we didn't we didn't really see him after the True. accident, unfortunately. That's a good point. Um, we he, but I tell you, we did see him for one play. Um, he, it, which how do you do, just, Dane? How well, was that play? It was the final play of the ball game. It's which it was kind of like the Landon Dickerson situation, yeah. you know, where they just put him out there so he could finish his career right, which speaks a lot to his you know character and you know the way they think of him in that program. Um, I like LeCount, to be honest with you. I I think he plays faster than whatever he was going to run. Um, you know, he's. Uh, his pursuit range is outstanding. He can play both sidelines. He plays fearless. Um, so, you know, I, I think you have to live with the inconsistencies that he has. But still, I, you know, he reminds me a little bit about of his uh, Marquise Blair coming out of Utah a few years ago. Oh, wow. Uh, kind of can do, can do a little bit of everything as a nickel. Um, you know, he's, I think he's an undersized version of a Marquise Blair. So I, I do like him. I like that a lot. Any other pro days, KT, that kind of stuck out to you and that numbers jump off the page, at least from uh, either in a positive way or a negative way? Well, I I can tell you that nothing that happened at the Pittsburgh pro day is going to make me change about uh, how I feel about any of these guys coming from Pittsburgh. Mm -hmm. I think all these guys at Pittsburgh, and some of them have like some some traits that are very interesting, but... after watching them, pretty much every evaluation I had on the Pittsburgh guys, I was kind of like, ah, yeah, you know, okay, Weaver's okay. Uh, Is that what that sound? Is that what that sound means? That sound means okay. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, you know, I'm not. Uh, sh- I'll let someone else have him. You know, that whole thing, like mm-hmm. Patrick Jones. You sit there and go, okay, great, good explosion off the ball, okay, yep. and then that's it. That's that's about it there. I thought Paris Ford's tape, the safety was terrible. Um, yeah. and, and, you know, Twyman is very interesting at, you know, 290 pounds. Um, but I I still kind of just on tape, I'm like, I don't know if, you know. And again, like, I'm talking about a hundred, uh, top 100 prospects. Are these going to be guys you, you would take in on uh, round three, you know? Yeah. And I don't think I feel that way about any of those guys. The the guy I kind of like from them, and I, it's not, it's not like in love, but like we're looking for safeties, right? I do like Demar Hamlin a little bit. Uh, I've got a fourth round uh, grade on him, 
But, you know, I, I don't know if he holds up as a free safety. I don't know if he moves well enough. So, again, I was looking for a little more clarity from those Pittsburgh guys, and I just I don't think you see that with them. Those Pittsburgh guys, which is interesting, is Twyman and uh, Twyman didn't play this year. He opted out. Paris Four opted out midseason. So we're talking about two guys that opted out and still ran those below average times. That's you know that that's that's saying something. Uh, when you have all this time to train and get ready, and you still turn in those times, I mean, it's just another you know dynamic to this draft process. Can, can I throw in a quick question though? Because there's one guy from them I haven't seen. And he allegedly ran under a 4540, I believe a 44740, was uh, Jason Pinnock, the cornerback. And he's the guy that I didn't like focus in on when watching them. Yeah. Uh, and I need to go go see him again. What, what are your thoughts on him? Yeah, I think he's a. I don't know that he's draftable. I think he's more of a uh, late round guy, uh, PFA. Uh, I, he did put in, turn in some good times and decent size. Uh, you know, not the biggest guys. I think he came in what five ten and a half, I believe. Um, but you know, he. I know his dad played uh, college football. Um, he played at a high level. Um, he consistency was an issue for him, um, and I think that's the biggest reason why he's not a lock draft pick. But I thought the times that he turned in yesterday certainly helped. Do you think guys like that, Dane, have a better chance of getting drafted this year or a lesser chance of getting drafted? And my, my point being just the fact that they do run and, and the fact that there is no combine and they are still going out there, they're competing, they're putting their times out there, whereas in the past you would have multiple chances for a good handful of prospects to put their times out there. Do you think those guys that are bubble draftable dudes that could potentially up their value just by running and putting out a decent time? I think that, um, you know, something that is interesting about this class is um, watching who who's a combine invite, who's not a combine invite. Yeah. Um, because the combine invites, we know we're going to get those medicals. Okay? And so... The guys that are in the bubble but are combine invites, they've got a much better chance of getting drafted because at least teams will have some clarity on what's, you know, you know what's going on with them uh, from a medical perspective. But some of these other guys, it's they're gonna, it's, it's gonna be a lot tougher to get medicals that they can trust because you know they're you know gonna get all these different you know information from the agents and from random doctors and teams aren't gonna know what to trust. So. I think it's fair to say we're going to have probably a record low uh, non-combine guys get drafted this year, um, and you know part of that is uh, you know character-wise not being able to learn more about these guys in person, the lack of medicals, um, but you know the putting up good times will help, but it's just going to be a tough. They're, they're they're behind the eight ball as they go through the process because of you know not having not be getting the invite to the combine, then not being able to be. You know, an official visit, not being able to meet with these teams, it's going to make it tough. It will make it tough. And I think scouting departments and front offices are having a tougher job than ever before trying to compile all of these different numbers and all this information. We'll continue talking about pro days here in the weeks to come. But when we come back here on the DallasCowboys.com draft show, time now for some Twitter on the 20. Got a ton of questions coming in on Twitter. If you have questions in the Periscope chat, Go ahead and send those in as well. I might answer one of those through the next couple of moments, but we'll do that when we return on the other side of the break here on the on the Draft Show. Sometimes nothing beats a classic. Miller Lite, the original light beer, brewed with great taste and only 96 calories, available for delivery. Celebrate responsibly. Miller Brewing Company, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. 96 calories, 3.2 carbs per 12 ounces. We're back with a tasty treat that's sweeping airwaves and taste buds. It's new Dr. Pepper and Cream Soda. Let's take a listen. Dr. Pepper and Cream Soda's here. A new combo that's music to my ears, okay. Let's play. Cream Soda and Dr. Pepper time. Pour it in a glass of ice. Ah, music to my ears and mouth. New Dr. Pepper and Cream Soda. A delicious duet. 
Hey, Cowboys fans, if you're thinking about attending a game this season, visit CowboysTravel.com to book your travel package today. Stay at the team hotel, have dinner with a Cowboys legend, and experience AT&T Stadium's exclusive VIP Owners Club. Also, tour the star, get autographs from your favorite players, and talk X's and O's with me, Mickey Spagnola. The official travel partner of the Dallas Cowboys will take care of all your travel needs. Visit CowboysTravel.com. There's nothing as unique as our eyes, which is why Essilor pioneers ways to make lenses as unique as you. Verilux for super sharp vision, Essential Blue for protection, and Crizol for freedom from glare. Three cutting-edge solutions in a single unique lens. So whatever your needs, insist on Essilor. Visit your local Essilor experts and find the perfect lens for you. See more. Do more. Essilor. Sometimes nothing beats a classic. Miller Lite, the original light beer. Brewed with great taste and only 96 calories. Available for delivery. Celebrate responsibly. Miller Brewing Company, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. 96 calories, 3.2 carbs per 12 ounces. This is the DallasCowboys.com Draft Show. Back here on the DallasCowboys.com Draft Show, we've got Dane Brugler, Jeff Cavanaugh, Kevin KT Turner. I'm Kyle Yeoman. It's time now for some Twitter on the 20. Twitter on the 20. Chris Beam, as always, punching the buttons in the back and doing a fantastic job. And we've got a lot of good questions coming in today, but I'm going to start with one from Cowboys Coffee Talk. And I want to talk safety with you guys for just a moment. He said, hey, Kyle, safety with the highest ceiling. Morig, Holland, Grant, Cisco. And he says, my apologies to Jeff for leaving out his tiny safety, a.k.a. our Darius Washington from TCU. So, Jeff, I'm going to let you answer this question first without Washington being the name that you say. But what were out of those four? <sighs> Morig, Holland, Grant, Cisco. So the tough part here is the two guys that I don't really like out of that group, I can't acknowledge that there is a potential for a big hit there. Like Andre Cisco, um, have they had their pro day yet? I haven't seen the numbers, but I'm told that no. he's going to be a really good athlete, and he's got a ton of forced turnovers, but I don't trust Andre Cisco. Like, I wouldn't take mm. him in the first three rounds of a draft. Um, he gives up more big plays than any safety I've ever watched. So, and then Javon Holland, I like the ball production. I like the way that he diagnoses what's happening. I just don't know if he's athletic enough to play corner. I don't know if he's physical enough to play safety, so I'm kind of scared of him. And so I'm going to narrow it down to the two guys that I really like. And gosh, that's a tough question because Richie Grant, I have tape of him playing a good amount of single high safety and showing the sideline to sideline range. And Merrick played at TCU where they basically ran a split safety system yep. where they both were deep half. Sometimes you're down, sometimes you're up. But Merrick probably has a blend of the physical tools that gives you a higher ceiling. And that's I think that's why he's projected to go so high because I think on tape, he's my third or fourth favorite safety. So, Dane, you tell me with Merrick, is it the blend of – prototypical size and you think that he's going to test well and he could be good at every aspect that makes him the number one safety yeah i think that's fair um i mean i personally i like richie grant as my top safety but mm. if we're talking highest upside if that's the question is which one has the highest upside then yeah i think you can make an easy case for merrick because of the range because of the ball skills um you know he's he's he was a corner and wide receiver in high school and so, you know, you still think he's going to get better at safety in terms of recognition, in terms of his steps. So, yeah, I think in terms of overall upside, Merrig, uh, probably the easy answer there. But as a just player and prospect, I, I give Richie Grant the edge uh, wow. just because I, I feel a little bit better about who he is, what he's going to be for me. Um, now, he's a little bit older than you want. He's going to be a 24-year-old rookie. But, uh, you know, I just, I'm just i a big Richie Grant fan and, and think that his game translates really well. I, I like Grant more than Merrick, but, uh, but because you guys uh, both answered with those players, can I throw out a wild card? A guy that's not even on there? What do you got? Even though, even though we haven't exactly seen him play safety? What about Sean Wade? <laughs> oh, I thought I you were like, going to hey, say Elijah Molden. For, uh, 
Everyone's forgotten about him. <laughs> hey, now, Molden's a baller. Uh, yeah, but he's a corner, I, I would say. <laughs> for now, I think we should call him a corner, I think. But Sean, I mean, that Sean Wade, for, just just for having fun here, you know? Well, uh, let's. What if he? Uh, what if he? All of a sudden, is drafted, and uh, let's say he's drafted in the sixth round, mm-hmm. which just could happen. Um, mm-hmm. And let's say all of a sudden he plays, and he's incredible. I mean, the ceiling's there. We've seen him play really well, like have a year of really excellent tape. Now playing uh, inside, and then a year of really bad tape playing outside. I'm just, just throwing that out there. That wouldn't be what my answer is, but I just wanted to be different than what you guys did because I'm kind of. Trying to come here from a centrist point of view. Yeah, it was. They also thought how, it was a how good. How early would be willing to bet on that? Mm. Day three. I mean, it, that's. I don't. I, he's such an enigma. Yeah, uh, he is. If what you saw this past year was a guy playing half speed who just looked like a fish out of water outside. Um, but yeah, I mean, based off his 2019 tape, when he was inside, he played a lot better. He's a physical tackler, um, but. You know, I, I still wonder if he has the traits, especially above the neck, needed to really thrive there. I, I don't know. I, he is he is one of the toughest players in this draft to figure out, no question. Yeah, he was one of those guys that, at least last year, KT, you're talking about moving him to safety and the potential of him moving to safety. Last year they thought it was a good idea to move him from a slot corner to an outside corner, and that didn't really work very well. So I don't know. Maybe his versatility just isn't what – it, it appears to be. Or maybe that was just because he wasn't a good fit at the corner spot. I think that's more likely, but I don't know. Maybe he just does, isn't as versatile overall as a player. Now, going on to this question from Justin on Twitter. This is an interesting question. I don't see this a lot from Cowboys fans, but he said, who are some of the possible mid-round tight ends to keep an eye on? Saying that he wants the <laughs> passing game to be quote-unquote awesome in this offense, can the Cowboys pass on the position with Dalton Schultz emergence and Blake Jarwin as a perpetual potential guy? KT, you're excited to answer this question. I like this question. I think tight ends are very fun to watch. A little bit of blocking, a little bit of catching. I really enjoy evaluating tight ends. Uh, Give me Tommy Trimble from Notre Dame all day long. And, you know, maybe... You know, you say mid-round. Obviously, you don't want the Cowboys this year unless it's Kyle Pitts spending mm-hmm. a premium pick on a tight end. But and Tommy Trimble probably goes. You know, I, Tommy Trimble probably doesn't make it to day three, but he no. might. And and no. yeah, so so it's kind of a, a guy I like. I also I like Yaboa from Ole Miss, and I know that I, he's a little. He's kind of an odd player. Just like he's six four, about two fifty. And he was at Temple for a long time before going to Ole Miss, but you know there's uh, there's some plays that he made on tape. Uh, especially one was in the Alabama game. It was very interesting. I think he's got pretty good ball adjustment skills. Like he showed that he can make catches away from his body and things like that. And uh, and I don't know if he's like an explosive guy. And I, uh, Lord knows this team probably doesn't need that player right now. But no, I don't think he's like a top notch route runner or anything. But I, I think he's a very interesting player with, with pretty good size and kind of a mismatch type of guy. Now, I feel like it feels like Carolina is a pretty good landing spot for him, uh, given mm-hmm. his history at Temple. Uh, uh, but that's uh, Kenny Yaboa from Ole Miss is a guy I like in the mid rounds of tight end. Yeah, that's not bad. I mean, this is an interesting tight end class because it's kind of like there's the the big time guys and then there's no middle class and then there's a lot of intriguing late round guys yeah. like Kyle Pitts is obviously at the top um, and, and then on day two you got Fryermuth and Brevin Jordan Tommy Tremble Hunter Long so those five guys are at the top and I think all are going to top 100 uh, Brevin Jordan I, I think would be the the one for the Cowboys that would be really interesting um, I, I like that fit a lot what, what he can add to this offense um, now, again, you have to get him in the third round. Uh, are they going to draft a third-round tight end? I, I doubt it, but, you know, who knows? Um, but, like I said, it, I, don't really, I don't really think there's a, mid, a, a mid-round tight end market this year. Like, you're looking at, uh, you know, Yaboa, McKitty, um, you know, guys like that. I don't, I'd rather have them fifth, sixth, seventh round. So, I, don't, I actually don't even have a tight end graded as a fourth-round pick. Um, wow. And then, in like, between rounds... 
five and seven, I've got like eight of them. You know, like just really intriguing guys. Uh, you know, like Pro Wells from TCU, uh, Briley Moore, Kansas State. Um, you know, there, there's a group of these guys that are intriguing and that offer something that you know at least are worthy of ha- a draft conversation. But you know, it's just I don't think it's a great year for the for a mid round tight end. Kyle Pitts. That's all you want to say. Do Kyle, Kyle Pitts. Yeah, if you're not picking Kyle Pitts, I don't want a tight end. I got two tight ends. I'm fine. But if you yeah. want to pick Kyle Pitts, pick Kyle Pitts. That'd be cool. I'll bring bring the belldozer back as a tight end three. We're good to go. I think I'm right there with you. I don't know if I'm really interested because of those two guys, because of, at least at the moment, the kind of discount that you would potentially be getting those two on and as starting caliber tight ends. Yeah, if you're not picking a big-time guy, I don't know if I would necessarily even waste a pick on that at this point. But those are intriguing guys. I like Trimble a lot, actually, as a player. I just don't necessarily know if the Cowboys need to spend a pick there. I'd rather spend that on a a third-round corner uh, or a third-round safety. I think that would just be a better use of it. Now, this is another question that kind of perked up my eyebrows a little bit just because I haven't seen this before. But Michael asked on Twitter – could you guys see a scenario, and this is going to make Jeff Cavanaugh, Mr. Captain Trade Down, either extremely happy or not so happy at all? I don't really know yet. Could you see a scenario where it would make sense for the Cowboys to trade completely out of the first round, stack plenty of more premium picks for 2022, where there's a more interesting draft class coming up than using this draft to fill more of the gaps expected next year? Jeff, do you like that as Captain Trade Down? Or if you're Captain Trade Down, do you have a cap on how far you'll fall? No, because let me tell you a secret about Captain Trade Down, okay? Captain Trade Down likes this draft. Captain Trade Down doesn't love the top 10 of this draft if you're looking for defensive help. Mm. So I love the idea of trading down. I absolutely do. I do not love the idea of using those picks. Now, look, as a long term play, you get better value if you are trading for next year's picks. So if you are a bad team or a building or rebuilding team, then I think that's a great strategy. The Cowboys plan to win. So I think that if you want to trade down in this draft, I want to still exist strongly in the second and third rounds because I think it's a really good draft there. I think the one place that it's a little bit worrisome is if you're picking around, oh, I don't know, 10th, and you're looking for defense. So Captain Trade Down does want to ride, but Captain Trade Down does not want to leave this year. Hmm. Dane? No, I get that. Um, personally, I, you know, if a team's offering me a one next year and a second round pick for number ten, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm thinking really strongly about that. And trust me, I no one loves drafting more than I do. I'd hate to draft out of the first round this year because I think you know, even if you don't love the top ten, there's still quality players you'd love to add to this roster. Uh, but the chance to add another day two pick, maybe another day three pick as well plus a, a one next year, uh, that's, you know, you got to think long term. And I think that would, you're getting excellent value at that point. So, um, you know, I, I think there's something to be said about the cap situation and, you know, filling out the roster with day two picks rather than, you know, like a, a, a top 10 pick, which, you know, makes X amount of money. Uh, you know, you have a chance mm. to trade back and still get a solid player, and you're getting them for lesser money. So I, I think that factors in too. So it, a lot of moving parts here. Um, I, I, it's worth having the conversation if the offer's there, no question. Uh, and I'll be quick on this. Let's, I think I, you start to get to round five, six, and seven, and maybe you've got it narrowed down to five guys that you want to draft, and then say, so, okay, there's three guys I want to take right here. Uh, and uh, a lot of these guys, let's say they didn't play last year. Uh, and I'm going off 2019 tape and things like that, then that's kind of where I'd go, you know what, if someone wants to get in back in the fifth round, I'll take a pick for next year. I think I'm, I'm more likely to throw around picks in the fifth, sixth, and seventh round. But I think that Jeff made a good point there. You're not planning to be picking 10th in each round next year. This is a team that's going to try to win, and uh, I think likely will be in the playoffs. So I think you probably have a, have a pick in between 19 and 32. It's a little different right there, but – you know, uh, but I, I'm willing to, to play that game in the fifth, sixth, and seventh round. 
And Dane also brought up the point of the money and the way that the the draft funds are going to have to be allocated. I don't know. Maybe is this year's salary cap going to be better than next year's salary cap? That's my biggest question because at least right now it doesn't look like that's the case. It looks like this year is actually going to be a better year for the cap and for the the different funds that would be allotted. Now you have 11 or 10 draft picks that you're going to have to go and dish that out to at some point if you end up keeping all of those, which I don't necessarily anticipate happening. But that's an interesting point to keep in there as well. If the Cowboys feel like next year's a better year to have multiple first-round draft picks on your salary, then maybe they do entertain some of those offers and maybe move back a little bit more. So that is something as well. All right, Dane, this one's for you. Jason wants to hear about the centers and guards in this class. We've talked a lot about the tackle position. We've talked a lot, of course, about the tight ends and the defense. But we haven't really talked a whole lot about those centers and those guards. So tell me just kind of a general synopsis of what you think of that interior offensive line. I think it's a really good group. Uh, I, I think that, you know, starting with the first round and working all the way through the draft, there's there's a center uh, or guard, multiple guards that you, you could draft and add to this team that are going to give you immediate depth and, and a possible future starter. So um, I'm a big fan of what the, both positions have to offer. Um, you know, a guy like Kendrick Green from Illinois, who isn't talked about a lot, but this guy's a top 100 pick all day long. Uh, he, he had an outstanding pro day yesterday. His movement skills are outstanding. He can play center. He can play guard. Um, Quinn Miners from Whitewater. Um, I think he's – I don't. I, I, he probably won't even make it to the Cowboys' third-round pick. I think he's going top 60. Mm. Um, but even into day three, you know, a guy like Drew Dahlman from Stanford would be a, a good pickup. Uh, Notre Dame's got a couple of guards uh, with Aaron Banks and Robert Hainsey that I, I think are going to be quality pros. Um, you know, I, I really I, like. You know, I was mentioned talking about tight end. How you know there was you know top 100 guys and then late guys, and like the middle class was missing. With my guards this year, I've got a lot of guys in the top 100. I think I have 10 guys in the top 100, and then I've got like eight guys between rounds four and, and five. And then I don't really like the late rounders. So I I love the depth of this guard and center group. So if, if that's a position they want to attack, they're going to have options for sure. Jeff, I I uh, hate the offensive line. I'll tell you that. And oh, I remember that. I was typing down I was typing down names as Dane was saying them just to get the list together because I have watched the first couple of round guys and um, like for the Cowboys, I don't view it as a big position of need, so mm-hmm. I'm not all that deep into it yet. But I do like some of the guys um, that I've seen. I think the Ohio State guy is solid. I think. The Alabama giant man, Deontay Brown, he's interesting. I don't think he really fits here, but I think he's fun. Clemson's uh, tackle, I think, might be a guard. Leatherwood at Alabama, I think, might be a guard. Um, I, I think the offensive line group, based on what I've seen, I like it. If you need an offensive lineman this year, I think you're in good shape. Well, and that's yeah. and that's a good point because a lot of my – in my guard rankings, a lot of them are former tackles with yep. uh, Elijah Vera Tucker from USC. Mm-hmm. He's the top guard in this class, in my opinion. He played left tackle this past year. Uh, Jalen Mayfield from Michigan uh, played right tackle, but I think he's I think he's best inside a guard. Uh, Alex Leatherwood, like Jeff mentioned, and, and Jackson Carmen. So that that's a, a part of what makes I think this guard class really really intriguing. So let, let me, can I throw out a question to you, to you guys? Um, Biadish at center. Mm-hmm. Do we do we see enough from him as a rookie that we we think he's definitely the future, or is it more of okay? Well, he did enough to earn him one more year to figure him out. I mean, what, what do we think about him long term? I think you're going in with him as the starter, mm-hmm. but and I'll tell you this: I think this applies to multiple guys on the roster. If you think that there's a guy available that can beat that guy out at the right value spot. I apply it to Donovan Wilson, too. I love what we saw from him last year. But if you just could magically put Jeremiah owusu Kormo on this team, he's taking Donovan Wilson's job. Yep. Uh, if you get to the second or third round and you think that there's a center on the board that's going to step in and beat Biotish out for that job, then you pick him. Um, and I would have no problem with that. I th- I, again, I think the draft is about value. If you run into a spot where you think center is the best value and he's the best player available and you believe he'll walk in and start for you, um, Biotish hasn't done anything to make me not want to do that. 
I think one thing too we've seen here is that they're the Cowboys are sometimes reactionary and uh, and kind of look at recent history and things like that. And there's some, a couple things that I wonder. I wonder if you know seeing the Connor Williams type at left guard makes them want to go more to a bigger mauling type. Mm-hmm. You know, um, just a guy who plays with a little more power. And I also even wonder about like. Where they draft that guy? If that's not maybe turn them off to like a second round offensive lineman. Mm-hmm. I know that's a, a a bit of a leap and a kind of a broad thing to say, but you know you follow their history. We know they're comfortable taking first round offensive linemen. Um, but like, there's some guys like I'm interested in like Royce Newman from Ole Miss who can play all five spots on the line because the Cowboys, mm-hmm. quite frankly, they've got some some guys who they just need to figure out. Yep, uh, Connor Williams is kind of being one of them. And I'm comfortable, if there's an injury to one of the tackles, I'm comfortable saying that Zach Martin is one of those guys. I know they'll say right guard, plug him in. But, like, I, I think I feel comfortable that Zach Martin can play right tackle. A guy, I, I um, not a good body, um, but you want a big guy. And I'm talking day three here. We're, we're pushing him back here. We're mm. going, like, in a round four here. Uh, Aaron Bakes from Notre Dame, I didn't hate. And there's, there's just something about the 340-pound guy – and again, it's not a good body, and it's not—it's uh, not always pretty. Uh, he gets beat every once in a while, but when he does hit his target and finish, it's a—it's a sight to be seen. And I just wonder if that's something you might want to take a shot at on day three, you know, uh, in the draft. Yeah, and I actually think Banks. I think if you want him, you got to take him in the third round. I don't think he's ah, going to make it wow. to the. I don't think he's going to make it out of the top 100. Um, I, I think he's going to go somewhere on day two. So uh, if he's there in the third round, I think that's what you got to do. And another name was Ben Cleveland. Give it, give it. Can I have him in the fourth, Dane? I think he's borderline. You know, could go late three. Uh, I know. Maybe he's still there in the fourth. <laughs> I, mean, I, I think, you know, it's borderline. I think, uh, honestly, the, what I've heard from teams, feedback on him is they just want to be convinced that he loves football. You know, kind of wow. one of those. Because he's a, he's a big hunter. He's a big outdoors guy. Like, you know, like there, there's some things that he loves doing that more so than football, and so teams just need to be convinced that football's top on his priority list. Which you know, I'm, they're finding they're trying to figure that out that answer during the process. Well, top on my priority list right now is getting us to break, so that way we can come back and hear Jeff Cavanaugh's different first, second, and third round scenarios. We're going to talk about that, and we're going to give you players. Which one would you choose? It's a game of this or that. When we return on the DallasCowboys.com Draft Show. Sometimes nothing beats a classic. Miller Lite, the original light beer. Brewed with great taste and only 96 calories. Available for delivery. Celebrate responsibly. Miller Brewing Company, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. 96 calories, 3.2 carbs per 12 ounces. The Cowboys way. Where 16 Hall of Famers and five championships shows us what success looks like. Where turkey is always the second best part of Thanksgiving Day. Where we are all defined by one single thing. The star where we as fans know it's our job to keep the tradition going. Bank of America is proud to be the official bank of the Dallas Cowboys and to support the quest of living life the Cowboys way. Copyright 2020, Bank of America Corporation. Honey, big news. Gary, are you okay? Oh, I'm not Gary anymore. I'm Jackie Flash. What? See, I want the latest smartphone, but the best deals are only for new customers. So to get a new customer deal, I changed my name to Jackie Flash. Okay, but the best smartphone deals at AT AT&T are for everyone, new and existing customers. That's huge. Then guess who's getting a deal? Is it Jackie Flash? Jackie Flash. It's not complicated. At AT AT&T, our best smartphone deals are for everyone. Restrictions apply. Visit att.com for details. Before there was a draft, you could size up a cowboy by three simple factors. The crease in his hat, the bend of his brim, and his unbending attitude. A man Stetson didn't just protect him from what life threw at him. It projected a rugged, unstoppable spirit. Stetson hats are still American-made with pride right here in Texas. They're still the unofficial crown of all self-respecting cowboys. And Stetson is proud to be on the field with America's team. Find a retailer nearest you at stetson.com slash cowboys. Sometimes nothing beats a classic. Miller Lite, the original light beer. Brewed with great taste and only 96 calories. Available for delivery. Celebrate responsibly. Miller Brewing Company, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. 96 calories, 3.2 carbs per 12 ounces. This is the DallasCowboys.com Draft Show. 
Final 10 minutes or so here at the DallasCowboys.com draft show. Going to get into this really quickly because I do want to hit all of these. It's a lot of fun from Jeff Cavanaugh. He orchestrated three different scenarios of positions, and then for each position group that you would potentially choose in the first, second, and third round, it would be three different types of players or maybe even more than that. So we're going to start things off corner in the first round, safety next, and then moving on to defensive tackle, which in my opinion I think is the most likely of the three, even though the Cowboys haven't taken a safety in the first or second round since 2002. But we've got the options up on the screen here. Jeff, what is your thinking with this position group one through three? Okay, so the to me the point of the exercise is try to take three positions that the Cowboys reasonably need that could be their first three picks and then draw me a map of what that draft could look like so that everybody who's listening or watching can see, okay, if you went this route and then this position and then this position, or what if I put that one first and then this one was third? And so just drawing out different maps to see what the draft looks like based on the depth of each of those positions and which ones you would like the best. For instance, if you're going with a corner, a safety, and a defensive tackle, well, here I'm going to take the cornerback first. Would you rather have Patrick Sertan, Richie Grant in the second, provided you can get him there, your free safety, and then my guy, Marlon Dane, say his last name, Tui Pulotu. There you go. That's pretty good. All right. He's my U.S. He's my USC nose tackle. So corner safety D tackle. I go Sertan, Grant, Tuipilotu. All right? Remember that. Now, let's take that same group of positions, but this time I'm going to start with the safety. I don't think there's a safety worth a top 10 pick unless you're calling JOK a safety. So in this scenario, you're trading down to who cares, 19, 20, whatever, right? So in this scenario, you're taking Trevon Merrick. And in the second round, I'm going to give you Elijah Molden, the Washington corner, and you're getting a bonus of Jabril Cox, the LSU linebacker, because you traded down. Hmm. And then I'm giving you Ohio State defensive tackle, Tommy Togai. Togi. 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 I knew there was an extra vowel sound. (laughs) Togi. And so now that is the safety going first instead of the corner. Now. Let's make the defensive tackle go first, and it's another trade down because I'm not taking Christian Barmore in the top ten. But you get Christian Barmore. I'm going to give you Richie Grant again. I'm going to give you a bonus of Georgia corner Eric Stokes because you traded down for Barmore. And I'm going to give you Jamin Davis, the Kentucky linebacker, as the position that's not listed, but you had an extra pick because you traded down. So, Sertan, Grant, Tuipilotu, Merig, Molden, Cox. Where's the extra vowel again? Togi 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 I. Togi I. Barmore, Grant, Stokes, Jamin Davis. And around the room, starting with Dane. Pick your winner. Which one do you like the best? Uh, I think the second one with with the four. Um, The chance to get the four players uh, with Merig, Merig, Molden, Cox. Togi. Yeah, I'm, I mean, I feel really good about now. You know, we have to make sure we have someone to play outside corner because Molden's more of that nickel corner. Um, but in terms of the players that I'm getting, I feel like really good Stokes, about that. Mm-hmm. You can make it Stokes or Melifonwu if you want to just trade out a name for a name that is a second round corner. Yeah. I'll allow it. Yeah, well, and that's tough because part of why I chose that is because of Molden because I, I like him so much as a player. Um, but re-signing Jordan Lewis is Jordan Lewis going to be the nickel? Probably. I mean, if they, I think what's going to happen is they're going to draft a corner in the top ten, and then they're going to have year five of Anthony Brown versus Jordan Lewis, <laughs> and Anthony Brown's four and zero in those battles yep. so far. So we'll see. Yeah, and you're probably right. So uh, I mean, just on the surface, uh, that second one would be, I think, where, the the way I would go. You get your safety. You get a, a really talented corner. Uh, a, a, a good linebacker that can help you, especially on third down, and then uh, a defensive tackle, give you that defensive tackle depth, really good run player. Kevin? Yeah, so, I mean, look, option one gives you Patrick Sertan, Richie Grant, and Marlin, uh, the defensive tackle from USC. What I would say is I'm going with group three there, Jeff, with wow. the trade down, because 
How much more do you like Barmore over Marlin compared to how much more do you like Sertan over Stokes? And I like Stokes a lot because uh, the safety on those on the, both of those combinations is Richie Grant. So Barmore or Sertan is what you have, and then you have on the third part right there Marlin or Stokes. I, it's pretty close, you know, about how much I probably like Barmore more than Marlin, more, about the same that I like. Sertan over Eric Stokes, but you have a bonus of linebacker uh, Jamin Davis. So, yeah, I'm going with the third one right there. We're going to get an extra lottery ticket, mm-hmm. four players. I, I Eric Stokes plays outside for me, so I've got my outside corner. I've got my defensive tackle. I still get Richie Grant, who I coveted all along, uh, and I get a linebacker to have fun with. So uh, I'm a I'm a fan of uh, Group Three there, Jeffrey. See, Kyle, this is why Jeff Cavanaugh is really good at these exercises because I'm split. I have number one, so that means all three of us have picked a different selection here. And the reason why I'm picking number <laughs> one, I'll make it quickly, but. Uh, Basically, it just comes down to which position is a bigger need for me out of this draft class. Is it corner or is it defensive tackle? Pick number three says corner is not as big of a need as defensive tackle because Barmore is going to go first. You'll still get Stokes, and I do like Stokes, but I like Sertan a lot more than I like Stokes. And sure, I might only get three players, but if you're telling me you're giving me a starting corner and then Richie Grant as a starting safety, I I think I would take that over maybe a, a depth piece in Tui Pelotu, and I would ride with Neville Gallimore, and I would ride with, with Tristan Hill coming back as well. So I would pick number one, but that's – I mean, I'm okay with any of these three. Like, Jeff, I think this is a perfect, perfect – case for the Cowboys because if you get any of these three, I feel like you're really really feeling good about your draft. Now, let's go ahead and move on to the next one really quickly since we're running out of time. Well, Offensive can, tackle. Who would Jeff pick? Yeah, Jeff, which one? Real fast. Which uh, one would Jeff you get? Doesn't, Jeff doesn't pick. Jeff designed the game, so okay. it's okay. way tied. Jeff That's fair. doesn't have to pick. All right. Yeah. Offensive tackle, Go corner, offense. safety. Offensive tackle, corner, safety. All right, here we go. So in different orders, you're going to get an offensive tackle, you're going to get a corner, you're going to get a safety. Round one, your tackle goes first. Rashawn Slater, Richie Grant, and in the third round, you're taking either Paulson Adebo or Tyson Campbell, whichever corner you like better. Now, I'm going to take the corner first. Caleb Farley. In the second round, you get Alex Leatherwood. In the third round, you get whichever safety you like between Holland, Cisco, Washington. So there it is, corner, tackle, safety. Then a trade-down scenario to take safety first because we just can't do it without it. Merig, Melifonwu, your bonus is, Dane, say the Washington D tackle's last name? Onzerike. Onzerike. All right, you're getting Onzerike as your bonus. And in the third round, Walker Little, Stanford offensive tackle. So that's going safety first. Those are your three options. Man. That one's tough. Go, what is the final, <laughs> the third scenario again? Who are the four Merig, players? Merig, Merig, Melifonwu, Onzerike, Walker Little. Wow. Yeah. My, what's up, man? My initial, my initial <laughs> thought. That's well, how you make a game, brother. My initial thought was one easy. Um, Slater, uh, you know, plug and play guard can play tackle. Um, getting T- Tyson Campbell in the third would be a steal, in my opinion. Um, who was the second? Oh, Richie Grant. Yeah, everybody loves Richie Grant. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I mean, one sounds really, really appealing, but the third one that that's piqued my interest here. <laughs> Training down um, fun. Well, it, it getting that extra player is. I mean, yeah, obviously the safety Trevon Merrick. You feel good about that. Walker Little's got so much ability, and he's got a big discount sticker on him. Yeah, he does. Because he hasn't played the last two years. But he's so talented that you see a future starter. Oh, man, that's tough. Yeah, at first I was going to take the first one. But it's like, uh, you know, you go to a restaurant and you order an appetizer platter. You get your, like, hey, I got my fried pickles and Trevon Merrig right there. I got my outside corner. Those are those are my uh, my cheese sticks. We got little sliders. Oh, yeah. Got my sliders right there and owns Zurique. And underrated, yeah. people not talking about him much because he hasn't been around, but the Southwestern Egg Rolls comes in and Walker Little, oh. who I like, Ooh. who in two years I, I like. I don't know if I want him starting next year, but I like him as a development guy yep. for one year just because he hasn't been around. 
That's my play right there. Is number three. Ooh. Now I'm hung. Now I'm hungry. Thank you. Yeah, I know. I'm Kyle, starving. Pass. Pick one. Uh, yeah, I'm picking Kyle, three. Pick I'm picking three as well. Even though I love Slater, and I think number one's the more likely. I think number three would be more fun for me because I agree. I think Walker Little as a prospect would be something that you could develop down the line, and that's perfect at tackle. All right, linebacker, safety, corner. Everybody Jeff, be quiet. go. Yes. Yeah, linebacker, safety, and corner. Group one: Micah Parsons, Richie Grant. Paulson Adebo, I'm out. Ordain, you can have Tyson Campbell. I'm letting you have a steal. Uh, okay. Group two, Sertan, Jabril Cox, and your third round safety. It can be Washington, Cisco Holland. And group three, Jeremiah Owusu Koromoa, Kelvin Joseph, Kentucky corner, or you can pick a different second round corner. Jamin Davis, Kentucky linebacker. That's one, two, and three. Parsons, Grant, Adebo, Sertan, Cox, Washington, JOK, Joseph, Davis. Go. I'm taking one. I'm taking Parsons. I'm taking Grant. I'm taking Tyson Campbell. Mm. Um, but I mean, I, and it all hinges on Micah Parsons being a, a, a good guy, which is up in the air. But as long as I'm comfortable with the character, I think that that's that's where I'm going. Yeah, same. Sorry, I wouldn't elaborate, but we're short on time. But I agree. First one. Mm, I'm thinking two, guys. I don't know why, but I like two a lot. I, maybe Jeff talked me in on Washington. You like two because two's the best. Yeah. Yeah, two has our Darius Washington. Yeah. Two's hot. I don't know. I might. I think <laughs> I like kidding? two a little bit. Feeling crazy. Oh, uh, I don't pick. Oh, I, that's right. You don't. I pick. created the game, so I don't. I don't. I don't have opinions. Go ACU. <laughs> ACU versus Texas, North Texas versus Purdue. Dane, you got a school in the fight this year? Uh, what what what's basketball? What do you? Oh, what, you don't know what draft basketball season. is. It Come is on. draft season. What, what are we doing? Sport. College basketball. What are we doing? Doesn't matter. It doesn't you have matter a bracket. <laughs> You've got a bracket. I don't, oh, man. I got three brackets. Oh, no, goodness. unless you're talking about cover two, uh, no, we're not talking oh, about brackets. No here. brackets whatsoever nah. for Dane Brugler. <laughs> that guy. means he's picking <laughs> North Texas to run the table and win it all this year in March Madness. That's going to do it for us here on the Draft Show. Thanks for joining us here over the last hour. Hope you learned something. I definitely learned something from these guys, and Jeff can sure make a game. That was fun. We'll have to do that again, Jeff. Well done on this or that. We'll be back on Tuesday with the other crew. This crew back next Thursday, 10 a.m. Central Time for Jeff. Cavanaugh, Kevin KT cool. Turner for Dane Brugler and Chris Beam in the back. I'm Kyle Yeomans. So long. Thanks for joining cool. us on the Draft Show. This has been a production of DallasCowboys.com and the Dallas Cowboys Football Club. How about this, Cowboys? Yeah!